Yes, brother. Yes. Uh, step by step, how would you enforce the rules you regulate? In what direction? How would you see it? Okay. If you as the leader right yep. now, given the keys yep. to rule the country yep. or civilizations, you know, yeah. How would you go about that? Right, ladies and gentlemen. So let's be clear about something. Christ said that his kingdom is not of this world, which means that it doesn't use the methods of this world to establish itself through the use of violence. However, Christians don't believe in a separation between politics and religion. That idea comes from the Enlightenment it doesn't come from Christianity. We Christians are committed to the establishment of the kingdom of God here on earth. That is why we say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Which means that we Christians do believe in statecraft. Paul tried to convert King Agrippa to the Christian faith which meant that Christians believe kings should rule as Christians. So to answer your question, bro, what I would do is this. It means that we would look at Christian values and we would look at Christian doctrines and we would seek to find a way to apply them in British law. I'll give you an example. Christians are pro-life. We don't agree with abortion. So we would either outlaw abortion completely or we would completely privatize it and then tax it out of existence. That would be an example of establishing a Christian law. But that law would then require other laws to be created, such as defending the rights of the father so that they could object to abortion, but then holding those fathers accountable for the children that they helped bring into the world so that they couldn't just run away and ab avoid responsibility for their kids. So we would then have to pass other laws built upon the first law. And this would be an example of how you would bring Christian law into the state. Let someone else ask a question. Any other questions, Any questions, ladies and gentlemen, or do I just go back to this guy? Sorry? Would we have democracy? So, the question is, in terms of Christian statecraft, are Christians committed to the idea of democracy? No. But are we opposed to the idea of democracy? No. Ladies and gentlemen, Christians are born and have lived in every kind of political government that has ever existed for the last 2,000 years. We were born in an imperial empire. We then went on to live in Western Europe into barbarian individual kingdoms. We then lived in an Islamic caliphate. We lived under a, nation, a liberal nationalism. We lived under a communist state. We lived under a Nazi dictatorship. We lived under a fascist dictatorship. We lived under liberal democracies. Christians can use any political system to establish the kingdom of God, and that includes democracy. I, as a Christian, think that democracy is the best form of civil government for one reason only, because it allows for the change of government without the use of violence. And that is an amazing achievement that we underrate, we under-recognize, and we don't celebrate enough. If you want to understand how amazing that is, go to all the countries that change governments through violence, and you will recognize how incredible democracy is. But we as Christians should use democracy to establish the kingdom of God on earth by establishing laws and a culture and a society that embodies the values and the principles of the teachings of the prophets and the apostles. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Or is it on topic? Then wait, no, it has to be on topic. Go on, bro. You gave the example of abortion. Yes. 
But while we was a Christian country for years and years and years, what you said didn't happen, that the father's held accountable. So if you're going to use that logic, then obviously when like the gays were persecuted, like we saw in my opinion, whatever. But how do you see it being different? Like we had years and years yeah. of Christian, it failed. Okay, let me. It failed us. Yeah, mate, and that's why we're in the state we're in. So let me reply. So I'd like to see what you call a stronger. I'm going to reply. I, I get the question. So, so let's get something uh, correct. Let's get something correct. The reality is, ladies and gentlemen, that actually, for most of European history, abortion has been illegal. It was only made legal in the United Kingdom in the 1970s. Right before the 1970s. Abortion was illegal. And actually, ladies and gentlemen, abortion technically is still illegal in the United Kingdom. Amen. They are going to pass a law this year, unless that law is stopped, unless you all speak out against it, to make abortion legal at any stage of the child's development. Which literally means that the day before the child is born, it can be chopped up and aborted. Ladies and gentlemen, it is fair to say that Christianity did fail in the West. So let's just analyze briefly why. It failed in the West because of a Christian civil war that happened in the 1600s when Protestants and Catholics killed one another by the millions, which then led to a socio-economic, cultural and political movement that we now call the Enlightenment. And for the last 280 years, Europe has been steadily moving away from Christian teaching, ladies and gentlemen. How then can we reverse that process? How can we reverse what's happened and I'm, I'm going to describe it in some detail because the way that we walked out of Christianity is exactly the path that we can walk back into a muscular Christianity and so I'm going to describe the ways we walked out and then you see the road map for walking back in what happened from the enlightenment onwards was a process of differentiation. Differentiation was the rationalization of society in which everything in our society was compartmentalized and systematized due to the ideology of reason and discreetly separated from one another. Now that had some good fruits. I'm not saying chuck the baby out with the bathwater. However, the process of rationalization is something that needs to be reversed. Our institutions need to be organized and energized by the Christian worldview, not by the ideology of reason. The second thing that happened at the Enlightenment was the de-intensification of religion through ideas like Religion is a private thing, not a public thing. You keep your religion in your home, don't bring it into politics. As Christians, we should utterly reject this idea as anathema, as heresy. It was not taught by the apostles, it was not taught by Jesus, and it is the apostles and Jesus that we follow, not the Enlightenment. We should seek to bring Christianity back into politics and we should seek to bring Christianity back as the governing principle of every decision that is made in society. Amen. We should increase the intensification of religion in our hearts, in our minds, in our soul, in our culture, in our economy, in our politics, in our, in our society and we should bind all of our institutions to it by re rejecting the, the rationalization of worldview, the idea that reason leads to truth by excluding revelation, which is one of the processes 
of rationalization. Yes, sir, I want a theocracy. Would you like to debate? About theocracy? Yes, right now. Right, sir, in that case, since you're not willing to debate, let me finish answering this gentleman's question. Finally, uh, sorry, a further thing that happened, ladies and gentlemen, at the Enlightenment is what academics called de-articulation and de-enchantment of the world. We lost a vocabulary in our culture to describe the world and the activities of the world in the mystery of revelation, in the supernatural, in the mystical. And what happened was, because of the emphasis of the scientific worldview, we lost any spiritual understanding of the reality of the world. Everything became explained through a scientific or rational ideology. And this became common vocabulary that disenchanted the world from the reality of God's energy in the world. We described the setting of the sun as the simple rotation of the planet rather than as a beautiful poem of Christ's rising and dying from the death. The gospel is declared every day when we look at nature. The sun that gives life and light to the world dies every day and rises again. And in that resurrection, the world receives light and life. Did you see what I did? I used poetic, theological imagery to enchant the world around me without any denial of science. I don't deny that the sun rises and sets or that the sun is a fusion engine of atoms. I don't deny the scientific reality, but I enchant the world with a theological language. I'll come to you, sister, once I've finished. Two more moves of the Enlightenment that occurred was the turn to the self, ladies and gentlemen. The turn to the self is the result of the Enlightenment that elevated the individual to the status of a god. Today we believe in our culture that a man can simply declare himself a woman contrary to all the evidence. Why? Because self is God in the West. The self cannot be contradicted. You can't hurt the self's feelings. You can't object to the self's opinions. All opinions are relative, all beliefs are relative, even when they contradict objective science, even when they co contradict clear morality and ethics, even when they contradict revelation of prophets and apostles. We as Christians must reject the turn to the self and we must embrace with real gusto and energy the identity of the church and that we are the people of God, one ecclesium, one holy Catholic and apostolic church around the world and that we are united to one another in common cause and in common brotherhood and that we reject the idea that we are God and that we declare our Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour alone who is the way and the truth and the life and the only way to the Father. Amen. The final, the final, ladies and gentlemen, move to the turn of the, uh, of the Enlightenment was a turn to this world. The rise of the scientific empirical worldview, which was brought about by a Christian paradigm, and the rise of the self, which was brought about by a reaction to a Christian civil war, resulted in a turn to this world. The idea that this life in this world is all that we have, and it is the most important thing. And so people in Western culture organize their entire life around the idea that this life in this world is the most important thing. 
We as Christians must reject that culture. We must live our lives in the fear of the judgment, in the fear of the judgment of God and in the joy of the grace of God and his gift of salvation, the knowledge of our internal destiny. This must be the reason and the basis around which we organize our lives, which means that working for the kingdom of God and seeking the kingdom in his righteousness must be the organizing principle of every Christian, both individually and collectively, even if that means working against international institutions, international law, the secular liberal state, the Islamic Caliphate, the Communist Party, Hindutva, we must, even, even the Buddhist militants of Burma, ladies and gentlemen. I already mentioned liberalism multiple times. Yeah, she came first, bro. But then I'll come to you. Ladies and gentlemen, all of this collectively can be understood by what sociologists call the plausibility thesis. If all your institutions and all your culture and all your society and all your economy and all of your life is organized with the assumption that God exists, then belief in God becomes feasible, reasonable and easy. What we had in the West was because we abandoned Christianity and constructed society on something other than God, a new plausibility thesis emerged which makes atheism and materialism and individualism the plausible option and belief in God implausible. So, you've waited so patiently. What's your question, sister? Yes. It's government. I mean, uh, UK obviously is now a secular uh, state. Yep. And uh, sometimes, you know, the Christians are kind of subdued yep. by certain religions like uh, Islam, yep. which is usually very aggressive and uh, uh, outspoken. Okay, yeah. You know? Yeah, so uh, how do you think it's possible for Britain to regain itself? Okay. As a Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, so ladies and gentlemen, how in a multicultural society do we go about building a, a, a new Christian society? Right, we've got to first recognize where we are in history. As Christians, we're not as weak as we think we are. Right, the reason why we think that we're weak is because we are applying liberalism to our activity. We're applying liberalism to our institutions. We're applying liberalism to our praxis. What we need to apply as Christians in our communities is a radical Christian militancy. And that means, ladies and gentlemen, that we form Benedict communities where Christians give up on the parish model. We move into a political constituency in our thousands and when we are in that constituency in our thousands, we then dominate the politics, the economics, the, the society and its local culture. We evangelize in our Benedict community and we evangelize outside of our Benedict community. And then we begin to rebuild from the bottom up. That is the simplest way I can describe the way forward. It's going to take radicalism. You need to become radical disciples of Jesus. You need to reject the churchianity of the 1800s and the 1700s because that churchianity has had its day. It might have been useful then, but it's not useful now. Times have changed and so our churchianity must change as well. Any other questions? Let someone else ask a question. Well, ask a question. Yeah, go on. Yeah, uh, my son's in the armed forces, and uh, before he went in, 
we talked about the idea of just war. But yep. if, if he were to take a life as part of his job, yep. then that's a matter, that's okay from, from my point of view. Yep. And it's a matter of conscience between him and God, providing it wasn't done with malice of all things. I wonder if you could just talk about the idea of just war. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, the, the question is about just war in the Christian tradition. The just war tradition of the Christian tradition, you can find in the writings of Aquinas, you can find it in the writings of Ambrose, you can find it in the writings of Augustine. Um, it is this idea, ladies and gentlemen, that we Christians can only participate in a war if the war is for a just end, it's for a just cause. And principally, and then we have a meditation within the Christian tradition that allows us to examine whether a war is just. Now, I, I don't remember all the conditions of a just war, but I'll give you some examples. The first of them, it must be to correct an injustice. You don't just attack people because they're non-believers, but you attack them because they are committing some injustice, like slavery or like because they're attacking your people. You must only fight a war if there's a, poss a genuine possibility that you can win the war. You must fight the war in the, in the purpose of actually creating peace. That's one of the reasons for a just war, is to actually stop violence. Now, I, there are other conditions, I've given you three. And within that, there is a, a principle of justice in war, which means that you don't attack civilians, you don't at harm civilian infrastructure. The doctrine of total war is something that emerged from the Enlightenment in World War I and then was practiced in World War II. I'm, I'm, I'm going to ignore you if you interrupt. I'm going to ignore you if you interrupt. Right, I'm going to ignore you then. Right, so ladies and gentlemen, the, the reality is, ladies and gentlemen, that as Christians, we are committed to just war and just practice in war. But I would say, ladies and gentlemen, Christians cannot serve the British government in their army. Christians cannot serve the American government in their army. Christians cannot serve the French government in their army. Why? Because those governments are not Christian. Those governments wage war against Christians. Those governments bomb Christians. Those governments give arms to armies that persecute Christians. No Christian can serve a government that wages wars against the church. That means that no Christian can serve in the Russian army. However, Christians do recognize that being a soldier is a vocation. So what does that logic imply? It implies that Christians can only serve in Christian armies, either formed by Christian governments or in religious orders that serve the church through the use of arms. Those of us who are called to arms must serve the church in their service through religious, uh, through religious devotion in religious military orders serving religious Christian governments. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? No, you were being rude, you were interrupted. So step one out, be patient, and I'll come back to you next. I'll come back to you next. You interrupted him while I was answering his question. Any other questions? Pray. Yeah, I know the school you're talking and about. Not only 
the shit do that, you know, parents, Islamic parents gathered outside, yep. you know, protesting and threatening this head of the So what's the question, sister? So the question I'm asking is, such situations, you know, that is happening, how come uh, Christians gather in that same right. school to also protest? Okay, you know, okay, so, so let me, why aren't Christians, why aren't Christians doing that? Let's be clear, ladies and gentlemen. Christians are all the time standing up against liberalism. They're doing it all the time. They're doing it everywhere. Christians are losing their jobs. Christians are getting in trouble with the law. But the problem is the Christian community is so spread out, so thinly spread out, that whenever Christians do it, they're just picked off as one individual. The Muslims are following what's called the Benedict Option. They move in together in an area. So when Muslims get activated around an issue, they can get 40, 50, 150 people protesting. That doesn't mean, ladies and gentlemen, that Christians aren't being activists. It's just that ac activist Christians are so spread out around the country that it's one family here and one family over there and one employer over there. Ladies and gentlemen, Christians need to recognize that our model of church is not working. The idea of being spread out is not working. And there's nothing in the Bible that commits us to that idea. So I want to encourage every Lutheran in England move into the same place. Every Orthodox Christian in England move into the same place. Every Roman Catholic in England move into the same place. Every Anglican in England, move into the same place. Every Baptist in England, move into the same place. And when you move into that place, you can create a culture and a society that look, sounds, feels, and behaves like Christians. And when the liberals come in and push their liberalism, you can take out your children from the school en masse. When that coffee shop sticks up that rainbow flag, you can put it out of business. When that politician says that Christ, he won't talk about Christian persecution, you can have him unelected. Your weakness, Christians, is not in your convictions, is not in your courage, and is not in your willing to stand up for your faith. Your weakness, brothers and sisters, is that you are just too thinly spread out and the fact of the matter is, if we all moved into the same place, you would find that those Christians who are really going for it would activate the lukewarm Christians and draw the lukewarm Christians into better practice of the faith. Our weakness is we're treating Christianity like individualism and it doesn't work. Christianity assumes collectivism. Next question, ladies and gentlemen. Do you think the answer is a Christian political party? And how, how feasible is it if you think we, we can get one in charge? Right. I want to counsel every Christian away from the idea that thinking that there's one answer to a problem. Take, if you don't take anything else that I say on board, take this on board. There is never just one answer to something. There's never a silver bullet. Every issue that we face is always a collective response. And as part of a collective response, Christian political parties are part of the picture. But they aren't a solution in and of themselves. You'll never get Christians elected to Parliament without a Benedict option. That is the only way it's going to work, ladies and gentlemen. Consolidation is the mantra of the, that the church needs to hear today. The, the, the watchword that Christians need to apply today is consolidate, consolidate, consolidate. Any other questions? Any questions about Christianity, any topic? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, do you want me to do another topic then? Yeah, go on, bro. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, yeah. if you are one of these people who say that I like to call myself a follower of Jesus but not a Christian, 
you are directly contradicting the apostles' teaching. Why are you directly contradicting the apostles' teaching? Why? Because Paul said to King Agrippa that I want you to be a Christian like myself. That's what Paul said to King Agrippa. I want you to be a Christian. The term Christian emerged in, I believe it was Antioch. It was first used as an insult against Christians. And Christians adopted that term as their title for themselves. The word Christian appears in the Bible as Christians own term of self-identification. If you claim to be a Christian, but you refuse to call yourself a Christian, you have erred. Don't get me wrong, it's not a major error, it's a minor error. I'm not going to fall out with you about it. I'm not going to say that you're not a Christian. I'm not going to refuse to have fellowship with you. You're still a Christian, even if you don't call yourself a Christian. But my point to you is, what's the point in adopting some of the truth of Scripture when Scripture, all Scripture is God-breathed, profitable for righteousness, correcting and teaching the man of God and equipping him for every good work when that Scripture says you're a Christian for following Jesus if you don't believe that that Scripture is also God-breathed. Any other questions? Go on, sister. I said we just have to follow Jesus. Not okay, ladies and gentlemen. So the question is, ladies and gentlemen, we just have to follow Jesus, not Paul. Ladies and gentlemen, in a sense, the question is correct. Why? Because Paul himself taught, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. But ladies and gentlemen, Jesus himself said to the apostles, go out into all the world, teaching and baptizing men in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit and discipling them to keep all of my commandments. Jesus himself said to the apostles, to you, Peter, I give the keys to the kingdom of heaven. What you bind on earth is bound in heaven. What you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. And so therefore, Jesus says, follow the apostles. And the apostles say, follow Jesus. So if you follow Jesus, you will follow Paul. If you follow Paul, you will follow Jesus. And if you want to know who's the higher in rank of those two, it goes without saying, it's Jesus Christ. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Go on. Basically, there's a verse in the Bible that says, love your enemies. Yes. So currently, what, what's happening in Palestine, I don't, I don't see that as loving my enemies. So I think that quote is wrong. Imagine, I'm a Kazian kid. My mother was taken. I was, I was, and it was I get your question, by, sir. By the Israeli. Yeah, what's your question? Me, he expects, what, he expects me to love the enemy who raped my mom. Right. The one who killed my family. So ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. How can we understand? So I understand your question. The question is, how can we understand? The, the, the teaching, love your enemies, must be wrong. Because if you love your enemies, you just stand by uh, whilst injustice occurs. And we Christians know a lot about the injustice that we have suffered over 1400 years of continuous Islamic jihad where Muslim armies for 1,400 years, without once missing a year, have invaded Christian lands, raped Christian women, kidnapped Christian children, burned Christian churches, and persecuted Christians in their own land, ladies and gentlemen. So how do we understand what it is to love our enemies in this way because that's the question ladies and gentlemen don't feed the hecklers with attention focus on the answer loving your enemies does not mean ladies and gentlemen allowing them to commit injustice and sin because allowing them to commit injustice and sin is not love and the love that Christians practice is not just 
love of your enemies. It's also the love of your neighbor. It's also the love of your brothers and sisters in faith. It's also the love of your mothers and fathers. So how can you love your mother, your brother and your neighbor if you allow them to be raped, burned from their homes and persecuted by Islamists? You can't. The man is right. Love demands that you stand up against injustice. So who do you love more? Your neighbor, your brother in faith, your mother in father or your enemy? Well, it goes your brothers and sisters in faith, then your mother and father, then your neighbor and then your enemy. As Christians, we wage war against the enemies of the church who are persecuting the church according to the principle of just war to protect our brothers and sisters and to bring about peace. Why is peace good for Islamists? Because their children don't die in war. Because their lands then don't get bombed. Ladies and gentlemen, destroying Islamist networks is good for Muslims because then Muslims can prosper in peace. When, as a Christian, we defeat our enemies, we should not persecute them, we should not maltreat them, we should not harm them. Once we defeat them in war and we are forced to wage war because of their aggression, we show our love because we don't take revenge upon them for their aggression, their violence and their injustice and that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you practice loving your enemies as a Christian. So, any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? No, let someone else ask a question. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? No, let someone else ask a question. No, let someone... Right, any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah, go on. What's your thoughts on your prophet? your prophet? So, ladies and gentlemen, the question is thoughts on the Apocrypha. Ladies and gentlemen, as a Christian, I want to recognize that Christians don't agree about this question of what's called the deuterocanonical books. However, let's be clear, both Reformed Christians and Catholic Christians believe that the deuterocanonical books are good books to read. We all believe that we should read the deuterocanonical books. The debate amongst Christians is whether you should teach from them inside of the church or whether you should just read them at home. Ladies and gentlemen, the church used the deuterocanonical books as scripture for most of its history. Reformed Christians took those deuterocanonical books out of the Bible. However, I'm not going to fall out with Reformed Christians about that question. I believe they've made a mistake, but I believe it's a, an error of a second order. It's not an error that's going to lead them into heresy. It is a significant error, but it's not an error that leads into heresy like a third order heresy. Oh, sorry, error. And so, I will have fellowship and I will have communion with any Christian who rejects the deuterocanonical books, but I personally believe they are inspired and are scripture. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? What's your word? Uh, yeah, do, do King James only is it? King James only is it? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I tell you no lie, I once knew an American pastor who told, who was told by his mother who went to a King James only church without any blushing at all that if the King James Bible was good enough for Jesus it's good enough for her. Ladies and gentlemen there is a error again of a secondary order within the church and within Protestant forms of the church that teaches the idea that the King James Bible is the only Bible you should use. That is an error, yeah. a massive error. 
And the reason why it's a massive error, ladies and gentlemen, is because not everyone speaks English. And not all English people speak King James English. And not all English people spoke the English of King James, that you find in the King James Bible, before the King James Bible was written. If you don't believe me, go and look up the term Middle English. It was the English spoken by the English before the English of the King James Bible. So what kind of Bible could those English people use? The whole King James only error is a massive error of ignorant Christians who have dogmatized their ignorance. Avoid this error. That doesn't mean that the King James Bible is bad. The King James Bible is a jewel of the English language. It is a wonderful translation. It's more or less accurate. And therefore, I celebrate it as an Englishman, I use it as an Englishman, and I give it out as an evangelist. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Go on, sister. Good answer. I think it's possible because uh, part of the reasons I see that Christians are weak, you know, in not facing the enemy. You can't debate me, Bob the Builder. You know, just ignore the heckler. You know, there's that. no unification. Uh, no, just, there's no unification of different churches. Be polite to your black sister, bro. No. There, there is no unification of different churches, you know, different belief in Christianity. And so there is division already, even amongst the Christians. So unifying for uh, to fight the common enemy is going to be difficult. Do yes. you think there is a possibility yeah. for the church to one day come yeah. together? Ladies and gentlemen, let's talk about Christian unity. I want to point out the historical fact that we Christians find ourselves in the mess of Western Europe right now precisely because of church division. That you can draw a straight line from the church civil war of the Reformation period to the present day. As part of undoing the mess that we are in, we Christians, Roman Catholic, Reformed and Orthodox, must find our unity. Now I am not a fantasist. I don't think that Christians are suddenly going to start agreeing on every doctrinal and dogmatic issue. But what we can all agree upon is we need to turn and face our enemies together. We need to turn and face the toxic feminists, the pro-choice militants, the progressive trans ideologue militants, the Islamist militants, the fascists, the Nazis, the communists, all those that are opposed to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the kingdom of God. And we can do that together as Christians because opposing your enemies in a united front makes no statement about your dogmas and your doctrines. It's simply a statement about what you are against. And so we can, in our first instance, find unity in what we are against together as Christians. In the second instance, we can celebrate every aspect of agreement, brothers and sisters. All Christians believe that we should worship the Trinity. All Christians celebrate the resurrection. All Christians read the four Gospels. All Christians venerate the twelve apostles. They just do it in different ways. All Christians venerate the image of the cross, though they do it in different ways. All Christians pray. All Christians believe in fellowship amongst believers. We can celebrate all of those things even if we do it in different ways, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the second instance by which we Christians can build unity. The third instance by which we can build unity amongst the believers is whilst we recognize that we have intractable differences, we can minimize the importance of those differences. The question around solo scriptura
can be minimised by recognising that all Christians see the Bible as an authority. The question around um, salvation through faith alone, by, by grace alone, through faith alone, can be minimised by recognising that all Christians recognise that salvation is by grace alone and that it is by faith alone and that good works are actually a produce of God's grace. And so we can minimise our differences and that in those three paradigms we can begin to build real Christian unity. Don't wait for the bishops. Don't wait for the pastors. Why? Because they live on your money and they actually have an economic reason not to want the church to be united. So build unity in the laity amongst brothers and sisters.